Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. Do you realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world? Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. Okay, this is uh, VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our DATV Experimenters Night. And uh, welcome to our night. Apologies, we get a few minutes uh, a few minutes late. We'll just start off with uh, acknowledgement to country. Uh, in recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, uh, we would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to all Aboriginal people, uh, the, the traditional owners of the land upon we, which we present tonight. And we've got a very special night tonight um, where I have... Uh, I actually have... Um, Warren Nicholas uh, and I'll just quickly whiz across to Warren uh, you can wave Warren because you're uh, you're now live <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, good to see you again Justin <laughs> oh, it's been a while it, it definitely has definitely has and I do I do like the beard and the moustache it's, it's very becoming <laughs> so it's um, scary how wide it is <laughs> oh yeah, well, <laughs> you don't have to tell me anything. <laughs> and I, I, I did wear the, um, the, uh, the, the, the hat specifically for this particular interview. So, um, so I, I, I thought this was. Uh, it, it, it's been cold here, Warren, but not. Oh, it's very appropriate. Yes, <laughs> it's been cold here, but not, um, not as cold as I suspect you're, uh, you're experiencing. So yeah. <laughs> so. Warren, um, what we might do is uh, I've got a series of questions um, which I, I thought uh, I thought we'd run through, and um, by all means add add um, add uh, whatever you would like to the, the 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 responses. But I thought we might start with maybe a bit of an introduction of yourself and uh, your your involvement with the the Antarctic Division. Uh, um, I'll, I'll say over at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, that's certainly a, a long time lag there. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> this is kind of like almost like a third episode for me being involved with uh, with Antarctic life. Um, so uh, back when I was in my 30s, um, I moved to Tasmania. I um, uh, picked up a job at the uh, Antarctic Division headquarters in Kingston, and um, 
I was based there as a uh, electronics technician in the science branch, building what um, what I like to refer to as affectionately as 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 bottom gadgets. So uh, these could be um, penguin monitoring systems or things like that. Um, an excellent job. Um, you could just innovate and create all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Um, did that for 15 years from um, 1991 till 2006, when I then um, left the division um, and started doing some uh, contracting work on my own um, life. Um, at the division again in the telecommunications section, okay. but not so much as a technician, um, more as a purchasing officer. Um, this was to deal with the uh, annual resupplies um, for the stations, um, uh, buying ICT equipment, radio equipment and so on. And um, the uh, telecommunications and ICT section needed um, um, someone who uh, um, could put up with the government purchasing system, but also had a, enough technical background to uh, <laughs> know what it was they were buying. So uh, <clears throat> um, that was my introduction then to sort of the uh, more sort of ICT area of the division. That um, was for about five years from 2010 to 2015 when I then left. Okay. And really since then um, had not had anything to do again with the division until um, last December when um, one of the chaps who um, um, works at the division and is a regular um, <clears throat> at the uh, Ham Radio Club, this is uh, Kim Briggs, um, I forget his call sign, I think it's uh, VK7. Um, KB. Yeah, help me out. KB. KB. Yeah. Yep. So... Kim said, oh, Warren, um, we, uh, we need to uh, uh, urgently find two techs for KC Station. Um, <clears throat> we've been unlucky, and uh, there's a last-minute drive to, uh, um, to recruit to um, very urgently. And uh, he encouraged me, so I put my application in. Um, <clears throat> I think it was uh, listed online on the AAD website for about one week. Um, the deadline was uh, midnight Sunday night, and I kind of uploaded my resume and application sort of in the 11th hour, so to speak, <clears throat> on a Sunday night. And the very next day on Monday, um, the division rings me up and says, oh, Warren, uh, you've uh, applied for this case job. Can you come in for an interview tomorrow? And I'm going, whoa, yeah. hang on, hang on. <laughs> I need to think about this a little bit. So... Um, yeah, so I went in for the interview, and um, yes, the rest is history. Here I am. Mm. Like, so, uh, so that that's a good segue, Warren, into your. So, what what is your actual role? Um, what 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 are you like? What, what describe to me a, a day in the life of Warren at Casey Station? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the actual role I'm filling here is. Um, Station Communications Technical Officer, or S, what is it? Um, Station Communications Technical Officer, SCTO. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so there are two of us here. My offsider, Nelson, um, um, somehow picked up on, um, on the vacancy as well and uh, managed to get his application in. And, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, the two of us... Um, then uh, arrived here uh, late February, early March, something like that. Cool. So basically, um, we have the responsibility of keeping uh, the radio infrastructure going, um, the satellite link to the outside world, which we're using right now, yeah. um, and and the um, all the uh, ICT. Um, uh, networking infrastructure here on station. Okay. Uh, so that's basically, uh, in a nutshell, what uh, our main responsibilities are. Okay. Is there just just expanding on the the radio side? There, there, there's obviously like local VHF type 
communications. Is there, and the satellite side of it, um, is there still any HF sort of infrastructure that you have to look after or, or, or the like? Yeah, so there's, um, there's a range of radio equipment here. So the uh, everyday um, um, uh, radio usage here is um, our VHF radios for uh, people around the station to stay in touch with each other. And um, um, these are uh, um, ICOM handheld ones like this one here okay. um, that work on the VHF marine frequencies. We also have um, a few repeaters around the place for uh, for better coverage. Um, we um, um, we also deal with aircraft um, um, as um, flights come into uh, Casey from um, from Hobart as well as other stations. So we have um, um, air bands, the VHF air bands, 120 megs, that sort of thing. Okay, um, and. We still have a little bit of uh, leftover HF equipment from, from earlier days. When I say leftover HF, um, there are some older um, <clears throat> HF antennas, okay. um, which are basically uh, uh, long wires in, in certain configurations like a tandem, tandem delta. Uh, yep. um, the HF comms um, is still used here. In fact, I used it end of last summer to talk to uh, the last aircraft as it was flying away from Casey Station. Okay. So, yeah, the HF, the main purpose of HF is really to uh, be able to uh, get in touch with aircraft when uh, they're not close enough to, to use the, uh, the VHF um, air band. Okay. And um, yeah, those HF frequencies can be anything like from 2 megs up to 20 megs, something in that range. Okay, okay. Cool. Um, do, do, you, um, do you get access or can you access the sort of the HF antenna systems for uh, other, uh, other cunning plans? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd like to. Um, um, it, um, yeah, a little bit awkward as in um, the uh, these antennas are um, outside of the station limits, so uh, uh, there's a bit of uh, travel preparation involved, um, <clears throat> mainly red tape, yeah. um, to get out to these sites. Um, but of course, for work purposes, um, I, I can get out there whenever... Um, I guess whenever it's necessary and the weather allows us to. Okay. Um, I haven't sort of jumped at the uh, possibility of maybe plugging um, a ham radio into uh, one of the nice <laughs> big antennas, um, but watch this space. Okay. Um, <laughs> hopefully, so, we'll get there. Oh, yeah. I know, well and truly, and, and you, I think you, you I, I remember a, an email. I, I think you commented that you have been doing a little bit of. 20 meters I think I think you said um, uh, what, what what sort of uh, what sort of um, setup are you using and um, and uh, yeah how, how, how has it been when you've got on the air has it been a absolute dog pile <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of yeah <laughs> yes well it, um, um, it really is subject to um, 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 I guess uh, propagation conditions and um, uh, on the rare occasion, it's pretty good, but um, so uh, my my current setup is uh, is an inverted B antenna, which I would um, hoisted up near a um, um, a shed here, which is um, um, heated, which <laughs> is always a good thing. I can sit inside that. It's known known as the hobby hut, and okay. um, um, I had heard of the hobby hut um, previously. Anyways. Um, so the hobby hut is is a um, um, is a space where um, people can um, um, do crafty things uh, for recreational purposes okay. rather than being a, a trades workshop full on. Cool. And um, so it's ideal, um, at least over winter, for me to uh, to set up my ham shack. Um, even has um, um, sort of a, a conduit. A penetration in the wall so I can get uh, an antenna feed to the outside cool. which is always uh, um, necessary mm. 
and the inverted V is um, um, holding up so far pretty well, at least the latest one is. I'm using a, a bamboo cane, okay. which are readily available here because we use them inland to um, stake out uh, the travel routes for um, traveling uh, around inland. Okay. Um, and um, so, yes, an inverted V, um, which is um, resonant at 20 meters. Okay. Um, so that's why I'm kind of locked into the 20 meter band at the moment. Um, <clears throat> I would like to work other bands, particularly um, 40 and 80, but um, um, it does turn out that there's a lot of QRM, local QRM from the uh, infrastructure here. Uh -huh. um, this is noise, um, a combination of things. Um, the powerhouse is nearby with some um, um, several generators. Yep. Uh, we have ring main units, um, electronic controllers. Um, yes, yeah, so there are artifacts um, <clears throat> to be found um, throughout the uh, 40 and 80 meter bands, whereas the 20 meter band um, is not, not so badly affected. So for the 20 meter band only, Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and then when I when uh, when I do get a chance, so the twenty meter band seems to uh, perform best during um, um, during the middle of the day. So I have a one hour lunch break, and um, 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 almost every day, at least usually every second day or so, I'll uh, I'll go into the uh, into the hobby hat and see um, what the propagation is like. And uh, um, typically, I can pick up Australian stations very easily. So I've worked um, a number of Australian stations, even uh, multiple times. New Zealand as well. Okay, fantastic. Um, um, it's interesting when uh, when you can get out to uh, to the states or 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 Europe. So uh, um, well, early days yet, but I I guess I have made um, about. Um, 80 contracts. Okay. I, um, perhaps, um, half of that to two thirds are, have been Australian one. And the rest have gone to, um, uh, places like Alaska, Germany, France, Indonesia, um, uh, Idaho, um, a few places like that. So, cool. Cool. yeah, it's starting to come together. Oh, fantastic! And I, I, I look forward to uh, to getting you in the log sometime, Warren. So, <laughs> you 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 you've given me a hint as to when you're on. So, um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll 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 try to be on twenty meters. So, uh, not a problem. Um, so uh, one of the I, I just had a question here around uh, one of the reasons we postponed this interview was. Um, you were you were shifting fuel from one place to another in the station, and I I, I just found um, I it, it seems to be a pretty major operation from sort of observation uh, as to to when this happens. Sort of it's all all hands on deck sort of stuff, and I, I wondered if you'd you'd like to sort of describe um what 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 goes on and and um you know why you need all these people to to be at particular and doing particular jobs so uh, yeah yeah well of course uh, fuel is a big thing here because um it not only provides us with the heating and electricity uh for cooking food and stuff like that and keeping warm but also all the vehicles that we have here and um and we also store fuel here for the uh, uh, Wilkins Aerodrome, which is uh -huh. um, where the international flights come in. Yep. Uh, that's um, um, a remote aerodrome about 70 k's inland from, from Casey Station. And uh, <clears throat> they have a lot of um, heavy tractor equipment there for grooming the ice runway and also for um, the vehicles traveling uh, um, back and forth. So... Um, um, the um, the so a fairly standard consumption of fuel for for a whole year here is around the um, six hundred thousand liter mark, and um, we have two fuel farms here. One which is closer to the shoreline, which is um, <clears throat> where the ship connects to when uh, when we get refueled from the ship. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And um, 
and then from that uh, lower fuel farm we can uh, transfer fuel to the upper fuel farm which is uh, closer to the station here and each of these fuel farms holds uh, between uh, 300 um, and 360,000 uh, liters um, so when we totally refill the station in summer um, we have both of those farms full plus uh, we've got satellite um, uh, tanks around the place so these are also networked to the fuel um, system if you like the fuel network um, these will be um, places where the vehicles refuel or also um, very close to the um, to um, um, powerhouses that we've got here so we've got the main powerhouse and an emergency powerhouse two separate ones okay um, for safety reason um, so yeah the scattered tanks um, which are uh, networked so to speak um, we call them satellite tanks and when everything is truck as we have over a million liters of fuel here wow <laughs> okay um, <laughs> So uh, um, we, um, yeah, we're now halfway through the year since um, since we've had the station refueled from the ship, okay. and um, so we've used up, let's say, about half of that fuel, yep. um, which was stored locally at the station, and the other half um, has been down at the um, um, at the um, at the wharf near the wharf. Um, and uh, so we recently transferred that fuel from from that fuel farm um, up to the station. And uh, the biggest concern about this whole thing is, um, well, number one is um, um, any leaks. Uh, we really um, pay attention to no leaks um, and certainly don't want any disasters happening where uh, we spring a major leak um, and contaminate the place. Yeah. Um, these are things that can happen and certainly in the past have happened so uh, um, there are um, um, I guess um, um, systems in place to deal with uh, such such a situation and this is where everybody on station gets some training in so if um, if we do have such an unlikely event um, everybody knows um, how to go about it um, the other thing is to um, when transferring the fuel, um, um, you have to make sure that you don't end up with any um, air getting into the system because then you have to start um, with the priming all over again. So uh, as you empty one tank, you need to switch over to the next tank and that has to be done very carefully. So you need a few people on site to do that yep. um, just to make sure you don't um, um, introduce um, any air gaps, yep. which means um, um, yeah, uh, substantial delays then. Um, and um, also, um, yeah, so you have um, a number of people at the lower fuel farm, a number of people at the upper fuel farm, and then you have teams that walk along the, um, the hose. It's about a one kilometer hose um, that we uh, run out between the two fuel farms. Okay. And so um, we continuously monitor that for any sort of leaks. Okay. So, yeah, um, most people here are not um, experienced um, um, diesels, as we would like to call them. So uh, uh, they get uh, an induction, so to speak, um, learn what um, uh, what's important. And then we have shifts um, of these teams as to do the transfer can take up to two to three days. Um, if for whatever reason, it's a little bit on the slow side. Um, on this occasion, we uh, we had no hiccups whatsoever, and we actually got the transfer done uh, in about one and a half to two days, something like that. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> that worked out well. Um, and um, um, yeah, my shift turned out that uh, I only had to uh, come on board once, and my uh, my second round, um, I didn't get called up for that. I was on the eight. Uh, the four o'clock to eight o'clock shift, and uh, I could sleep in on the <laughs> this the second round as I wasn't required, so that was good. Yeah, very My good. particular role was actually uh, very comfy. I was sitting in the office of the control and um, just taking in all the uh, the readings. Um, 
every 15 minutes, um, the lower fuel farm and the upper fuel farm would supply us with um, new readings of how the fuel is going. Okay. And uh, these were um, entered live into spreadsheets so that we could monitor um, how the flow rate was going. Okay. And um, that would also calculate like an estimated um, finish time. Yeah. So, big operation. Yeah. Oh, well and truly, and we're not talking about normal diesel, are we? This is a this is a special blend, I think, isn't it? Yeah, this um, this is diesel that um, has been refined, um, taking some of the paraffin out of it, which um, will go waxy in in these very cold temperatures. So. Uh, um, I guess, in a sense, it's a thinner diesel, yep. um, and it's very clear in color. It looks almost like water. So, uh, <laughs> again, if we do have a leak, it's not that visible, um, <clears throat> but it certainly smells like diesel. Mm. And mm. this special Antarctic blend um, is suitable for uh, all the generators and all the vehicles that we've got here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we, we've got a we, we've got a few people who uh, are, are online and, and watching right at the moment, as well as a. a um, a club rooms full of people out here who are all watching as well. You on the big screen, um, but uh, a a Anthony uh, Anthony Goggins here asks: um, uh, First of all, how long are you down there for, and uh, what's the food like? Uh, is it all baked beans and spam? <laughs> um, excellent question. No, it um, so um. um as, as a wintering expedition, a winter is typically spend a year here. Okay. Um, but um, because of this late recruitment, um, um, I came in at the very end of summer and um, um, it was planned or was it looked like the uh, this uh, uh, engagement was strictly for the winter season only. So I could be out at the um, earlier part of next summer. So. Um, I might be here for uh, just a minimum of, of eight months. Okay. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's the minimum I'll be here for. But okay. um, um, we'll just see what the summer brings. Yep. Whether um, there's some um, um, requirement for me to uh, to stay on longer or not, which I'm I'm quite prepared to do. Okay. But um, yeah, um, I um, I have spent um, a few summers down south before in my uh, uh, initial uh, engagement with the Antarctic Division. Okay. Uh, but um, uh, winters is a completely different kettle of fish. So uh, the high population disappears, and um, once that last ship goes or the last flight, you look around and you see the people that you're going to be living with for uh, a longer period of time and you think okay well this is us and there's no more getting out of this place anymore either <laughs> right so okay. that's 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 a pretty unique experience um as a winter yep. um the, the smaller number of people and um um so we actually um by the time i got here when i got here in summer we were about 70 people and we're now down to 30. yeah okay. um, 30 is actually a large number and is in fact the largest wintering crew that uh, australia has ever had in the antarctic okay. so um, um other stations may typically be between uh, 15 and 25 expeditioners uh, over winter yeah okay uh but, um yeah the Station is quite large, so um, look, there, there actually there have been a few people I haven't actually seen now for a couple of days. I sort of <laughs> think, where are they? <laughs> well, there um, you go. Usually, you get to see them during um, during meals, but um, if they uh, are doing shift work like meteorology or so, then uh, you might um, miss each other uh, on regular regular um, uh, periods. Okay. Um, yeah, and talking about meals, look, the food here, shocking. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Like they're, they're not on the uh, scales. So we have a chef here, um, and um, even though he works only a 40-hour a week, so uh, that could be, you know, his normal days might be a bit long, and then therefore he... ...periods off, so... Uh, 
uh, that's when we need to fend for ourselves. But um, okay. no, on a whole, the food is excellent here. Yeah. And um, I think a, a lot of um, experience has gone into keeping uh, fresh food as long as possible, um, such as eggs. Um, we still have apples um, months now, months and months since the last flight. We still have fresh apples. I think the citrus fruit, like the oranges, I think they've um, um, they've been used up now. Okay. Um, and um, so uh, vegetables and stuff like that. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of the stuff um, is is frozen. Okay. Um, meals like look for for evening dinner. There's usually um, a variety of things. Um, let me think. What was there last night? I think. There was some sort of chops as well as some sort of chicken, um, baked potatoes, and some uh, steamed vegetable. Um, but we also um, have um, um, vegetarian and vegan food available. Okay. okay. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it must be good because our uh, vegetarians and, and vegan are. They get stuck into it and seem to really enjoy it. Oh, there you go. I love yeah, it. Yeah, so there's plenty of food and it's good quality. Okay. Um, some of the um, some of the novel uh, novel sort of fun things that that uh, <laughs> that uh, that you uh, you get up to uh, uh, that you'd like to you, you're prepared to share with us, uh, Warren. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, um, I guess one of the things that um, um, I've noticed now in winter, uh, we've got uh, a constant layer of snow or ice outside. Uh, when there's been snowfall, um, then uh, sort of the uh, the large and the small um, um, bulldozers are there um, kind of um, clearing the path a little bit. Anyway, shoes are always clean. The boots are there's no dirt on the floors. That's uh, that's, that's pretty unique. Um, I, I do like that. Uh, the other thing which is um, interesting is as as we headed into winter and uh, the sun was getting lower and lower, um, you have these extremely long um, twilights, if you like. Uh, sunrise is a very slow process. Then when the sun is finally up, um, it doesn't actually go very high. It sort of cruises horizontal to the horizon, yeah. and then it starts going down again. So, um, yeah, the official daylight hours might only be um, like two to three hours at the moment, yeah. but they are getting shorter as we speak. But the twilight is, is quite extended. Yeah. And um, um, as you know, um, we've just had a full moon. In fact, it was a, what do you call it, um, a... Um, King mm, Moon. Okay, um, okay. I, 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 I did see some uh, very nice photos. So, uh, yes. The, what, what was unique was um, uh, the moon has a very wobbly orbit. So it can be that um, when the, you know, it's not exactly opposite the sun. Um, the sun can be elevated and the moon can be elevated. And uh, it struck me yesterday while the sun was up above the horizon. I could see the full moon, which was also above the horizon. I mean, both were uh, in opposite directions and very low above the horizon. But yes, you could see both at once, which I thought, hang on, <laughs> what's going it. on here? So I had to work that one out. I love it. Um, that was pretty, pretty unique. Cool. Absolutely. Cool. And um, yeah, uh, what else can I, uh, what can I mention? Well, and your supply of chocolate here. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's not good for the waistline. <laughs> um, so, it, it, Warren, we, we're counting down because we've only got three three minutes forty five to go before we we the 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 the, uh, the zoom link drops out. Uh, so I'll I'll, I'll, yeah, okay. I'll finish up with um, what what sort of final comments. Um, Final comments from yourself to the to the club to to whoever. So uh, over to you. Yeah, well, um, certainly um, um, I'm, I'm 
really have enjoying this experience here. I'm looking forward to uh, catching up with everyone in the club and um, um, when, when I'm back at home in Hobart. Um, yeah, I would love to uh, share my experiences. Um, also, um, uh, I, um, <clears throat> I will try and make radio contact with, some, with the club members. I am in email contact, um, not hard to find me, uh, qrz.com, yeah. uh, can help on that one, and um, yeah, just shoot me an email um, so that we can arrange a skid. Fantastic. And um, yeah, maybe in a few months' time or so, we can have another quick uh, interview like this. Well, well and truly, well and truly. Um, and and I'll, I'll 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 book you in now for a uh, for a presentation when you uh, when you finally make it back. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's good. And it's been a great experience. Um, I've seen um, remnants of previous hams that have been here uh, last winter. There was Paul Daniels, mm. um, BK Zero, Papa Delta. Um, who kindly gave us a talk at the hand club after his return and told us how he had to build a uh, foot switch. I've found that foot switch and I plan to use it myself. I love it. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, very good. Very good indeed. (laughs) Well, maybe it'll become the, you know, the, the... that like a trophy that gets handed down to person to person, <laughs> it's the foot switch. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, look at that! Look at that! I love it. <laughs> oh, very good, very good, very good, Warren. Uh, fantastic. Um, so thank you, thank you very much, um, and um, thanks to our uh, our uh, our people who have asked asked their questions um, and come up. Um, really, really, really enjoy this, and I'll, we'll we'll lock in another one in uh, in the uh, in the future. Now, uh, just before quickly, we've got a minute to go. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, Rex is uh, on his way. Uh, actually, we'll probably be in um, be in Hawaii by now. Um, so uh, he's uh, he's off uh, with it, with his equipment and bits and pieces to. Uh, to hopefully uh, hopefully break some uh, break some records between Hawaii and the uh, the mainland US, so uh, so he's uh, he's on his way. So, oh, <laughs> uh, uh, sounds great. I'll keep my fingers crossed for Rex. I did hear someone from Maui the other day, but they couldn't hear me sadly. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> anyway, thank you, uh, thank you, Warren, and uh, look after yourself. Stay uh, stay warm, stay safe. Yep, okay. Great. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. All right, that was uh that was uh Warren VK Zero uh Whiskey November uh and VK seven Whiskey November. Um and a, a fantastic uh, fantastic interview uh from from Casey Station uh and I just I'm blown away by the fact we can we can have a Zoom session with Casey Station. Um that is just uh off the off the show. So uh so there you go. Absolutely love it. Um all right uh now um the uh, the next bit of the program um I I have been banging on about um <laughs> absolutely banging on about um uh about um um, crystal radios, crystal radios. Now, if I push the big button and I walk around here, we'll uh, we'll we'll go. Um, now, the <laughs> what are we looking at? Um, this is. Um, you would have seen last week um, a, a crystal detector, um, and in fact, what I'll do, I'll, I'll zoom in here. We'll see how far we can uh, we can zoom in here. Um, and a bit of focus. Okay, so the crystal detector has um, has shrunk a little bit. <laughs> You notice there's a a holder, a brass holder here. Uh, there is a smaller crystal, uh, Galena crystal in here. 
and then there is a little arm that uh, has uh, what looks like a safety pin. That's because it is a safety pin. Uh, that is the uh, the cat's whisker, if you like, that is touching the the crystal and uh, uh, creating the diode effect that enables us to uh, to get rectify the audio off the uh, RF. Um, there is. Uh, there is, as I zoom out, no, other way, Justin, um, as I zoom out, you'll notice, um, and a bit of focus, that'll do, um, there is a, a coil, uh, now this is uh, antenna matching, uh, antenna matching coil, um, on the, this is about a 19, 20s to 30s design so a little bit that they, they'd realized that a little bit more advanced and they could match the impedance with a with a antenna coil so this goes off to the antenna and i've got it hooked up to the uh, the club dipole and then there is a uh, a, a, a much uh, a much longer coil uh, much more uh, inductance in here with a tap off at about a third the way through that coil uh, this end goes off to the, the variable capacitor, so the variable capacitor and this coil forms the resonant circuit that enables you to tune and provide a little bit of selectivity through, uh, through this, and I'll show you that in a minute. This is the, the antenna matching coil, and then off of this little tap here, it heads off and goes to the, 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 the crystal detector, which is what makes it a crystal radio. Now, what I've done here is... Um, well, there we go. You can you can hear the the radio the radio there. I'll just zoom in a little bit more here um, because I've done a bit of a sneaky done a bit of a sneaky here. You'll notice <laughs> there's a little push switch here, and it says push for germanium diode. I've put a little germanium diode in here, and if you push this, it's serious. With right at the moment, you can hear Madison Welsh. That's using the crystal, the Galena crystal detector. And decides that. And if I push the the germanium diode, Sean, and in 2016. Hillary Clinton you notice, and I can, I can shoot. In the basement of this place. Was that? There is no basement in the pizza restaurant. Mm. Doesn't exist. So, so <laughs> you can you can see um, one of the 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 advantages that um, uh, that germanium diodes have over over crystal detectors. And you can hear. That's actually not bad. Um, I, I, but one of the things I'm going to demonstrate is it's very easy uh, to... There we go. And, yeah, I mean, it is complete. This is not a thing. That is New South Wales Energy Minister Matt Keane. Yes, I don't think that's changed. It, it's not that I had a paper. Four oh seven metres, late scratching seven roses memory. Someone who I saw to a composer who said to me. The British government insists it won't change its immigration. In 2016, part of the disinformation. So, um. So that's a crystal radio. Now, you would normally have a set of high impedance headphones. I, I've got a powered speaker here um, so that you can actually hear what's His going on. Life hasn't gone in really great and, direction. And what's coming out. So, uh, but that's um, that's the crystal detector um, and the the using a galena, which is a, a lead sulfide crystal, cubic crystal. Um, and I've also put a little um, a germanium diode in here, I've spent a year with these just things. to uh, to show you the to understand. the uh, the advantages of a of a um, an actual diode, uh, germanium diode. 
Um, but uh, anyway, that's the uh, the development of the crystal radio, <laughs> and I've got a, a little bit more playing to do with the uh, the crystal detector uh, because it is it is quite um, touchy. Hello, Kim. We can only hear the left channel. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Everyone's a comedian. Um, <laughs> there we go. Shot up the restaurant, was arrested, did four years in prison, and my friend came out of the bookstore and saw all the cops everywhere and the guy with slow hair. Yeah, there's a lot of polishing in poetry, isn't there? It's... Oh, I mean, not for every poet. So, anyway, that's... And literally, um, there is no power here, no power at all. I, I've got a powered speaker here, but that's separate to the whole thing. There is no power here. It's and, um, a different beast. That's you can, AM radio, you right glorious, uh, glorious amplitude modulated uh, AM radio. Initially, it's not so much um, finding exactly the right word. That's certainly part of it. And so, uh, so uh, we'll be doing a little bit more in relation to this. That's the, the whole reason um, that we, uh, we came up with this. Now, what I will do is I'll just show you the design that I the, that I ended up using um, is uh, now. Just bear with me. Let me just, and I'll switch that off so that it's um, um, we don't have glorious AM in the background. Um, uh, let me just. So the that is the now. Let me. This is the Allied Knight um, kit that was produced um, produced uh, back in the. I don't think there's a date on this actually. 1954, 1954 or 56, one or the other. And this is the this is the design. Uh, this is the layout that they they produce. Uh, the actual um, the actual schematic is on the back, so very simple. Um, it is it is. Um, let me get a pen. Uh, your antenna, your antenna matching coil, uh, which is the small twenty turns uh, winding on the one and a half inch uh, former. Then this is a hundred and ten uh, or of ninety four because I used a different type of wire. But it's around a hundred turns uh, at about thirty turns, so about third the way along is what goes off to your detector. This is uh, this is if you like that's the germanium diode or the uh, the galenium detector, and then off the end of the uh, the, the tuning coil uh, through a variable capacitor, uh, which you know it gives you your tuning and your selectivity. Uh, you can then uh, tune that. The signal comes out here. Um, and there is a transformer effect here, so it act is actually a, a reasonably uh, boosted signal just here, uh, rectified by the, the diode out through the high impedance headphones, and that's that's your crystal set. Um, this this particular design was used was used by a, a, a whole range of people. Um, this is all built into a nice little cigar box, uh, so you could uh, you could uh, uh, take it with you. Um, so it, similar, very similar design, um, drawn slightly differently, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but all uh, all uh, all the uh, the the same uh, the same theory and idea behind it. So. Uh, so yeah, and that's uh, that's come from a magazine in 1949. So uh, so there you go. Um, but anyway, so that's uh, that's the um, the the design of the uh, the crystal. Um, uh, let me go to here. So that's what that design looks like in uh, in real life. So, uh, so there you go. So um, now um, I'll, ju <laughs> I'll just show you uh, where this actually started. Um, where this actually started was uh, there was a wonderful little design that used a pencil. Um, and this particular design does work. Um, I, I have 
did have this uh, this working on the bench. Um, so um, let me zoom out here a little bit. There we go. This um, this is where this design started with. It, this is a stock standard pencil. Um, it, it's uh, it has uh, a couple of hundred turns on it. Um, then there is a little slider, a little brass shim slider that enables you to tune up and down. And I've, I've got a little bit of wet and dry paper and taken the enamel off one of the uh, hexagons on the pencil. Um, and that, that makes contact. And this certainly, uh, certainly did work. Um, not quite as well as the design with the antenna matching coil uh, and then a tapped coil. Um, but it, it, it's um, the design. The original design had uh, the Galena crystal uh, mounted in the end of the uh, where the rubber. You take the uh, the rubber out and put a Galena crystal in there, and then you put a little cat's whisker around to the Galena crystal, and literally that's that's your uh, uh, that's your uh, crystal radio, <laughs> and it, it certainly does work. I've got um, you can you can see if we if we zoom in there um, there is a, a, a Galena uh, diode oh there's a Galena diode sitting there <laughs> on the end um, and uh, that provides the the detector um, and then your headphones would come off one end would come off here and one end would come off uh, ground and uh, that's uh, that's a, a pencil crystal set which certainly works, not quite as well as the, um, you, you do need a good ground and a very good antenna uh, for that particular, uh, that particular uh, uh, crystal set. But uh, this one, as you heard, uh, works a, uh, an, an absolute treat. So, uh, so there, you, uh, there you go. That's the, uh, the, the, the state of the art crystal uh, experimenting that's <laughs> been going on in, uh, in South Hobart just, uh, just recently. Now, Amateur Radio Magazine. Uh, the, the magazine comes out every two months from the uh, peak body, the Wireless Institute of Australia. Uh, this is the latest. This is uh, volume 90, number three. Uh, we went through a few, um, a few uh, uh, articles there um, last week. Uh, we'll go through a few more, uh, few more this week. Um, the one of the uh, the ones which is uh, uh, very, uh, very close to uh, to my heart um, is um, the. We'll zoom all the way out here. Um, building a automatic tuner for a magnetic loop antenna. Now that magnetic loop antenna is the um, the PEX pipe. So the gas pipe that uh, designed with the trombone, uh, the trombone uh, matching capacitor here uh, by G uh, Jim Tregillis, VK5JST. And um, John Forrest, VK3JNF, who's the author of this, that's, uh, that's his, uh, his antenna, has come up with a, uh, uh, an Arduino, um, I think it's Arduino, I'm pretty sure it's Arduino, uh, automatic controller that controls the uh, uh, the the trombone capacitor to do the matching. Um, here's his little here's his uh, Stockton bridge, uh, SWR bridge uh, that sits up. I assume up in the uh, up in the uh, the magnetic loop, and then it comes down to the control box, uh, which uh, and he talks about the uh, the programming. Uh, the little display on it that uh, shows what it's uh, what it's doing. Uh, stepping through SWR tune, SWR tune success, uh, and uh, yeah, it takes you through uh, how we put it, that together and how it actually works. Um, care and feeding of long loop yagis by for best return loss. Now this is by a very famous um, microwave experimenter Doug Friend uh, VK4OE, who is a huge contributor to uh, Gibstech. Uh, and he talks about his uh, his loop yagis and the care and feeding of loop yagis, which is a, a great article. Um, uh, a bit more there. Um, ah, we've got uh, some silent key notices, and one is uh, uh, from uh, about Harvey Skegg VK seven uh, HK. So uh, so that's uh, a, a bit of a VK seven connection. 
Now, um, antenna modelling using Fornec 2, uh, which is a uh, freeware uh, antenna modelling um, um, uh, package, and how to uh, how to use it. This is part one, uh, and goes through uh, setting up the uh, the antennas in the in the system, uh, and uh, what you can use Fornec 2 uh, to to do, and then model uh, model radiation patterns and all sorts of stuff. Um, now over to you. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, letters to the editor effectively, and then the AQZ, uh, the VK3 AQZ, Louis De Stefano, um, wide range RF power meter part two. So this is the uh, the second bit of the uh, the the RF power meter uh, article that was started in the uh, the last edition. So uh, so uh, yeah, that's um, that's. That's AR Magazine, the latest. Um, also, um, comments on uh, mitigating uh, amateur radio interference to VDSL2, uh, published by NBN Co. And uh, this is an article by Phil Waite and Dale Hughes, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think the summary of this particular article is, um, the NBN uh, article is uh, found wanting, <laughs> is probably a, a diplomatic way of putting it, uh, and uh, some comments around that. Uh, David mentioned VK5KK, uh, the VHF UHF expanding world, and all about 122, uh, 122 gigahertz um, uh, uh, feeds uh, for dishes and 3D printing of them. Um, this is a very nice uh, polished Cassegrain uh, uh, dish for uh, 122 gigahertz, very high precision uh, material. Uh, this is the the VK5 uh, KK 122 gig um, uh, transverter. Um, Meteor scatter report by uh, Kevin Johnson, another uh, another uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, microwaver. Uh, Dr. Kevin Johnson VK4 UH and talking about meteor scatter. He does the meteor scatter um, uh, column each uh, each week. Newcomers notebook uh, diodes uh, the electronic non-return valve, uh, which is uh, we we experienced uh, the germanium diode in the in the crystal set just then. So uh, so yeah, um, and uh, Alara of course the Alara column by uh, Jenny Wardop uh, VK3 uh, WQ um, and. The Alara VK3 Alara lunch um, uh, book review, uh, but the Flying Doctor story, uh, 1928 to 1978 uh, review of the uh, the Michael Page book by uh, Brian Clark VK2 GCE. Um, actually, there's a <laughs> wonderful wonderful picture here of Alf Traeger uh, who came up with the with the Flying Doctor uh, radio. And he this this is a uh, a, a foot operated generator. So you pedal the uh, the generator to uh, to power the uh, power the valve radio. Um, technical correspondence, ham ads, and uh, that's our uh, and of course the uh, obligatory uh, advertising. So uh, that's Amateur Radio Magazine uh, number ninety, uh, volume ninety number three. So uh, so that's. Uh, that's amateur, our latest amateur radio magazine. Uh, very quickly in uh, in summary, uh, this comes as part of your uh, membership. Uh, you can get it in hard copy form or in digital form as a, a membership um, uh, of the uh, Wireless Institute of Australia, which I encourage uh, encourage all people to uh, to do and support our local body. Um, now, I, I finish off on a very sad note here. Um, I, I, uh, hang on, hang on. I really do need to put a rope on that mouse because it disappears down underneath. Um, but uh, I, I, I'll finish with a, a little bit of a sad note <laughs> because um, one of the, uh, my 160 meter, um, <laughs> my 160 meter uh, antenna, uh, with the big blow of 2022, <laughs> the big blow of 2022 ended up um, with my 160 meter antenna on the ground. Uh, I had three um, 
three guy wires sitting off of this, which were also the uh, formed the capacitive cap. Uh, now two of the guy wires broke, which meant uh, there were there were no um, guy wires in two places, and of course the uh, antenna fell over. Um, the bottom of the antenna, which connects to the vertical, the six meter vertical, um, cracked out, absolutely smashed all of this, uh, smashed all the way up into uh, into this fitting up here. Uh, <laughs> so there's a big crack uh, through here, um, and uh, the base of the vertical which had a spike in it. Uh, that's the spike just there. Uh, it was held in originally with three screws, which all sheared off. <laughs> so, um, so a bit of a sad, uh, sad state for, uh, for the, uh, the 160 meter vertical, uh, which was performing wonderfully and receiving uh, US stations. But uh, yeah, it's not receiving anything right at the moment because it's pulled apart uh, awaiting repair. So uh, that's the uh, that's the story uh, that's the story there. Oh, and there's <laughs> there's the um, uh, the uh, the uh, crystal set. Um, so that's that's a sad note to finish off on. Um, now next week, a big reminder. Uh, next week is Kim Briggs uh, VK seven KB, who um, who uh, Warren mentioned. Uh, now, Kim will be giving us a talk on electronics techniques, specifically for Antarctic equipment and uh, expedition equipment, um, and some of the uh, and actually show he'll have physical uh, physical equipment that he will be showing uh, up here. Uh, we will be streaming it, um, so that's next week from seven thirty. On the 29th, uh, 29th will be a little bit of a special night. We'll have a couple of other quite old crystal sets, original old crystal sets from uh, VK7 JGD, Gary, and VK7 CDW, Chris, uh, in the studio. And we'll also have a Zygu G90 transceiver in the, uh, in the studio to play with. So, um, so... Uh, we've had the uh, the F FDXC uh, uh, last week. Um, we've had a 705. We've had an 897. We've had an 817. Um, so uh, we we'll have a a Zygu G90 uh, in the studio with the little um, platform that goes on uh, with the cooling fan and everything in it. So uh, so that's uh, that's in two weeks' time on the 29th of June, uh, and. A big shout out, we, we, you would have seen if you're on Facebook, uh, we have a fox hunt uh, on the 23rd, I think it's the 23rd of um, July, up here from 9.30am, and we also have uh, in July, on July the 15th I think it is, uh, it'll be the Ham Radio Trivia Night uh, that we will be broadcasting, it'll be an online hybrid event, so... Uh, uh, you can uh, you can participate uh, either by being up here or being online, and it's a ham radio trivia night. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, and uh, what uh, what uh, Hayden VK Seven HH from Ham Radio DX fame uh, has in store for us. So that's our program for tonight. A huge thank you to Warren um, and others who have contributed to uh, tonight. And we'll catch you in a fortnight's time. And see you up here for the uh, for the Kim Briggs presentation next week. Uh, Seventy three, and uh, we'll catch you uh, next uh, in a fortnight's times. Cheers. <laughs>